Carson Wentz's breakdown on the contract has come out. Very clever. We'll uh, dive into that. What else we got? Uh, Minicamp continues. Got uh, news and notes from today and more. It is the Sports Bass live on 97.3 ESPN. This is Football at Four. John McMullen, every day, joins us for a little football talk, a little NFL as he appears via the Boardwalk Honda Hotline. Johnny Mack, what's going on? How are you, Mike? The Carson Wentz contract. <laughs> That's guess. right. This is the Carson Wentz contract in the flesh. And uh, some new details out today, which I saw you tweet that suggested that uh, Howie Roseman, uh, you know, uh, was a pretty, uh, pretty smart guy when putting this thing together. He's almost showing off a little bit with this. <laughs> Well, we uh, we already kind of knew that, but I, I did joke. I think Howie and, and Jake Rosenberg, who is also heavily involved with negotiating contracts for this team, were showing off a little bit. But it, it is far more complicated uh, than the average NFL contract, and, and part of that is uh, the 30% rule that the NFL has and, and the fact that there's going to be – uh, a new CBA, uh, likely in the middle of this thing. Uh, so there's some uh, some flies in the ointment that have to change things. But everyone saw that 30 million team option for 2020, and, and we're jumping off bridges because they assumed the Eagles that was an out, and that's not an out. Uh, the vast majority of that is guaranteed. Uh, and, and that's always the key in any con- contract. It's, it's guaranteed. And that option has to be decided in 2020, but it's actually for 2024. And if the Eagles decline it, which they could, then Carson's salary jumps up about $28 million for that season. So that's where the guarantee essentially comes in. In other words, the Eagles are not declining that option it was just an accounting trick uh, for the cap. Yeah, um, and I had read something about one of the years. I mean, according to, uh, I guess it was at, uh, Breer uh, had a tweet out there. Some, one of the guys about his contract, the annual uh, one year is like $14 million, something like that. Well, uh, for there's different years in his base salary, but the essence is Albert ran down the base salaries for, for each year. Uh, they go far higher than that later in the deals. But uh, early, as we talked about, you know, when Joe Banner got a – This got year, is, by the way, his base salary this year is 720000 Next year, yeah. 1.3. And the following year, 3.9 is the base. So his yeah, base remember, salaries are very low. Yeah, early in the contract, they're very low. But remember, the first two years are his rookie deal. And that's sort of what happens. And uh, you, you, the vast majority of the money is guaranteed in bonuses, whether it's a signing bonus, a roster bonus, uh, and and base salaries are are often very low. Not just for rookie players, but for veteran players, because you're guaranteeing the money. So that's when we talk about, in essence, the salary cap. And that's what I was saying with Joe Banner. He explained, and nobody's better at it than Joe. It really is just accounting. That's what it is. And and you've already spent this money. You've already agreed to this money. So from a fan's perspective, the best way I can explain it to, to sort of uh, drive out the white noise, so to speak, is focus on the guaranteed money. And the guarantees are $66 million, uh, essentially from how they structured it. Carson's going to see that $108 million. Uh, and that's all that matters from the player's perspective. Yeah, um, Albert Breer tweeted that he spent over an hour on the phone with contract people, and now he has a headache that this thing is <laughs> way more complicated than most deals. Yeah, it is. It, it is, and that has a lot to do with his uh, position and, and what I said. There's a 30% rule in the NFL which says somebody coming off their rookie contract cannot make more uh, the next year than 30% more. Uh, And that created an issue because when you talk about the quarterback position and and what those guys get paid, that kind of throws that out of whack. So these are all these 
sort of fail safes the NFLPA and the NFL have, have put together in the CBA, and you've got to find ways to overcome them if you have to pay somebody a lot of money. Essentially, that's what the Eagles are doing. Yeah, John McMullen is with us here, uh, and we got news on Eagles minicamp today, including uh, an injury to uh, – what are they going all hockey on us now? Nelson Aguilar with a lower body injury. Look, there's nobody that you need to hide this injury from. There's no opponent this week. I, I can't no. deal with that. Well, yeah, I've talked about that in the past, and the Eagles made another change in, in their medical staff uh, yesterday. Uh, well, the news came out yesterday, but I, I talked about the real issue not being care or, or how the doctors are taking care of the players. It's the messaging. Now, from the Eagles' perspective, in the off season, you don't have to, uh, by league rule, uh, inform the injury, uh, inform the media about injuries. In season, you do have to. So, uh, if Nelson's de- dealing with hamstring, they would have to. Uh, tell us that in season with the injury report, uh, even though Doug tries to be clandestine with that stuff as well. In the offseason, he doesn't have to say anything, so he doesn't. But it, it's not serious. And as I said, if there's anything wrong, a tweak, they don't feel 100%, they have a sniffle, uh, they're not going to practice them. And, and Nelson was out there today. He looks fine. He was helping the younger receivers sort of acting as an extra coach. So it's nothing serious, but uh, he has been uh, out of the last uh, OTA practice, and now he's going to be out of the entire mini camp, and he'll be back for training camp. Yeah, I know uh, we talked about uh, J.J. Ortego-Whiteside yesterday, but I'm interested a little bit in um, the two AAF guys, Ward and Johnson, about do those guys have a legit shot to maybe – do something in training camp. And, and, you know, Johnson was a pretty good player, if you remember. Uh, you probably certainly do with the Vikings, for the people out there. I mean, he was pretty good for a little while. And there's a lot of stories that have come out this week about how he kind of lost his love for football and then this AAF kind of reignited his fire. But uh, do, you know, guys who were household needs for six weeks in that league, uh, do they have any shot uh, uh, out there? Well, I think a lot of it depends on – what happens? I mean, this team is very deep at receiver. Uh, they really are. You know, we, we don't even talk about Matt Collins anymore. He's back uh, working in individual drills, so he's finally going in the right direction, uh, and you have to throw him in the mix. So you know, uh, I mean, all sound Jeffrey, Sean Jackson, Nelson Aguilar, J.J. Arcega Whiteside are going to make this team. Uh, and when you talk about a 53-man roster, that means you're keeping five or po- potentially six receivers. Uh, and if Mac Collins is in that mix, that's number five. So it's going to be really difficult for any of those guys to make this team. And if they do make it, they're going to have to do something on special teams. It might be being the punt returner. We talked about Deshaun Jackson doing it in high leverage situations, but they don't want him doing it every single time. And that's where somebody like Greg Ward or, or even Mark and uh, Michael, who, uh, Michelle, who is uh, Sony Michelle's brother, uh, the Patriots running back, he's been really, really impressive at, at camp. And they have some return skills. Uh, Charles doesn't, and he's older, and he's 30 years old. So I, I believe he has the talent to play in this league. Uh I just think this is not the best situation because the Eagles are so deep at position. Yeah, and it's not one of those things where, like in a lot of sports, where if you have a bunch of guys at one position, you can try to just trade one of them because everybody knows he probably won't make the team. You know, because I can just think everybody's thought is, oh, how about trading one of these guys? Or are well, uh, one yeah. of those guys impressive enough that you can trade one of the guys in front of them? Well, I think a lot of that, and, and J.J. Arcega Whiteside was really impressive again today, and we talked about him a little bit yesterday. How do you how do you generate playing time for him? I don't know if you can, significant playing time uh, with Alshon here. Um, and if he continues to show that he belongs on the field and has a tremendous trading camp, maybe you do think about trading a receiver uh, to make room for him. And obviously, if that happens, uh, then somebody on the back end gets bumped up, 
and 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 makes the roster. But uh, I, I I don't know. I mean, this team believes uh, this organization believes the window is open to win a Super Bowl. Uh, I think they're correct as long as Carson Wentz is healthy. Uh, and if that's the case, I don't think you want to trade away proven players because. That's what you do. You go for it when you have an opportunity. Definitely, yeah. And uh, I think the Eagles will will lean in that direction. Yeah, no, definitely. I mean, you get to – when you're where the Eagles are right now, especially if you give the money to Wentz, you put your best foot out there every single time to try to uh, take as many stabs at this thing uh, as you can. Let's look at some of the other notes from today's uh, mini camp today with John McMullen at J.F. McMullen. Um, and, uh, you know, one of the things I, I had, um, seen about, uh, was the, what's the rookie quarterback, uh, the heck is the Thornton? Thornton. Yes. Uh, that, that he has been, you know, early on, you had talked about that he was not very good, uh, but that he has been catching on a lot quickly. And I know he's the third string guy, but we know in this town, the backup guy and the third string guy, uh, those things mean a lot is to see how the backup quarterback, uh, competition is coming along, and you wrote it was a mixed bag today for Carson Wentz, but uh, Nate Sudfeld struggled apparently as well. Yeah, Nate was not great today. I, I thought this was probably his worst practice uh, of the off season. just holding on to the football too long. At one point, they were working uh, seven-on-seven drills and, and backed up at the goal line, and, and Doug Peterson blew the whistle and called the safety because he, he was holding on to the ball so long. Uh, we'll say, I mean, it's, it's Nick, he's not Nick Foles. Let's be honest. I, I mean, Nick Foles is when he was here is the best backup quarterback in football. Uh, he proved that, um, two consecutive years. Uh, and when we talk about the depth of this team and how impressive it is, we just talked about a receiver. Uh, you can talk about it on the offensive line. Uh, you can talk about it a lot of positions. You can no longer talk about it at a quarterback. There is not great depth at quarterback. And if Carson Wentz does go down, it's going to be a scary situation because that could turn this from a 12-win team into an under 500 team. That's, that's, that's the kind of difference you're going to be talking about this season and it's not only Nate, it's Cody Kessler, it's Clayton Thorson. Those guys are not ready to play. Yeah, no, I, I think it's definitely a storyline, definitively in training camp, right? Yeah, I, I, I mean, but this is sort of the normal way of the NFL. Uh, you look around the league and nobody's confident in their backup quarterback. So the Eagles have been spoiled. Uh, for the past couple of years with Nick Foles being here. And they they went with it as long as they could. And now we're heading to a new phase. And there's not – the Eagles will say different, obviously, but there's not going to be confidence in the backup quarterback, uh, no matter who it is. And it's going to be Nate Sudfeld, but there's not going to be that same confidence there. No doubt. Um, the uh, You tweeted uh, – you uh, wrote about at 97.3 ESPN.com. Uh, that the uh, Eagles worked on Hail Mary today. That's got to be a fun drill, just chucking it up and seeing guys go up there and get it. But it takes a special skill, you know, and they got a guy uh, in, uh, obviously, Alshon to go up and get that. Is, J- is Arcega Whiteside another guy who gets involved in that kind of play? Well, yeah, I mean, Doug likes to work on situational football. He talks about that a lot. So at some point, whether it's in OTAs, mini camp, training camp, they get to everything at some point. Uh, and that's one of those things, and attention to detail. Everybody gets to do it, the, the backup receivers. Uh, uh, but those guys, in, in theory, uh, the guys with the length, like Alshon and, and J.J. Arcega Whiteside, and the tight ends, yeah. uh, Zach Ertz and Dallas Goddard as well. And Richard Rodgers, hey, he, he's done it with, with Aaron Rodgers in Green Bay. He had two really, really famous uh, Hail Mary uh, catches for wins. So they have a lot of long body guys uh, for that type of situation. I like it. Um, uh, we, uh, we talked yesterday about Malcolm, and, you know, you put the story up about say, him saying that he feels that he's outplayed his contract. And 
there's a lot of people that are, ah, I mean, going after Malcolm for saying that. I mean, do you feel that, number one, him saying that he's outplayed that contract, it might be true. And here's where the problem in lies in football. You may have outplayed it while you had it. The problem is now where you are, you might not be able to equal that production, right? That's always the problem in all the sports. Well, that's always the issue when you're talking about extending players uh, past the age of 30 in this league. You, you sort of have to gauge, and uh, that's where the Patriots' mentality has always come in better to give up on a player a year early than a year late. Uh, and you have to weigh in uh, where you think that particular player is. And I've talked about it with Malcolm in the past. Some of the things that make him so valuable uh, also hurt him in this type of situation. The fact that he never leaves the field, he never misses plays, never takes a day off in practice. Uh, there's a lot of work on his body. The assumption is if you're being logical about it, using your heart, is that when the decline comes, it's going to come quickly. And that's it's a difficult decision for the Eagles to make because he's such a valuable player. He means so much to the organization. But I think those criticizing Malcolm, uh, to be honest, just don't understand that's this business. That's how this works. Well, like players the, don't. Some of the comments yeah. were, I like Jenkins, but I don't think he has played anywhere near that contract. All the secondary, for that matter. All these guys for the past few years, including the Super Bowl year. I'm sorry, but how can you outplay a contract when you're beaten by double moves every game, extremely poor tackling? Uh, another one, uh, really? Because our secondary got torched all year last year. So he is guilty by association almost. Well, <laughs> I don't know what to say to that. You're talking about a guy who's played every position uh, on the back end except middle linebacker, which there's not another player in football that uh, has that type of versatility. Literally, there's not another player in football who's done that. One of the reasons the Eagles didn't completely, completely fall apart last season with all the injuries is because of Malcolm sort of holding down the fort. And even at one point going to Jim Schwartz and saying when guys like Cravon LeBlanc had to play and he was straight off the street and didn't know the system, and even players that nobody knows about, like Josh Hawkins, who was in that game against the Saints in the playoffs, people forget. Uh, Malcolm went to Jim and said, look, we got to simplify things for these young guys. And the Eagles really improved down the stretch. I don't think people understand how important he is to this team. And I've said it time and time again, while Fletcher Cox is the best player on this defense, Malcolm is the most important player. Uh, the Eagles know that. And I've said it from day one. They will get something done. All right, Sports Bash Live, 97.3 ESPN. Tomorrow is the final day of uh, mandatory mini camps, and we will have more on uh, the Eagles then. Of course, you can get all the Eagles coverage at 973ESPN.com and follow John McMullen at JF McMullen for all the latest on the Eagles as the final mini camp day tomorrow. And then we have a little bit of a break and uh, we'll get you ready for the dog days of summer with some good football stuff to get you ready for the uh, look at each division and the teams and the quarterbacks. By the way, got an interesting quarterback situation going on with the Giants, right? Yeah, well, I, I, you know, I've said when, once they pull the trigger, uh, it's going to be sooner rather than later when it comes to Daniel Jones. I mean, they're not going to be a very good football team. And when you take a quarterback that high, there's tremendous pressure to get him on the field. Because what do you say? You say, well, we can lose with the young quarterback. At least he'll learn something. Uh, at least you can start it and, and get him going with the offense. And that's how people will look at it with the Giants. Yeah, uh, it's uh, interesting stuff from uh, the Giants camp out there. We'll have all on the NFC East and all the teams taking you through the summertime with football at four right here on the Sports Bash. Thank you, John. Thanks, Mike. All right. Uh, John McMullen, like all guests, appeared by the Boardwalk Honda Hotline.